debating death and memory, past and present. It's an archaeodeath debate. Welcome to my latest video, which is going to be looking at how archaeologists, as experts in the archaeology of the 5th to 11th century, and particularly the Viking Age, that's the sort of later 8th and 9th centuries, but particularly through to the 10th and 11th centuries, how we can explore TV representations, how can we approach TV representations of our discipline. Now, there's one thing when we come across documentaries, which are supposedly uh, informed and engaging with archaeological research. But what do we do when we see popular TV shows uh, taking archaeological ideas and running with them? How do we respond to that? Well, perhaps 20, 30 years ago, we would just have a they've got it all wrong approach. But um, now archaeologists in the 21st century are, have a more mature approach. Our aim is to communicate our research, our primary research, to wide audiences. And therefore, both documentaries and fictional shows, drama shows, sci-fi, horror, whatever media it may be, are integral method methods by which our evidence, our knowledge, is shared out in the wider sphere, in wider popular culture. Now, often it gets translated and used and abused in ways that we don't like and we, 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 we try to counter. And we cannot, the first point is, we cannot leave the story with the creatives and artists and journalists and others who would take our information. We've got to respond to it qualify, expand, adapt and move forward. So in other words, we've got to, if we're going to do this research and disseminate it, our job doesn't end there. We've got to be part of the ongoing conversation. But having said that, we shouldn't just object every time um, some journalist or some um, creative program, some fictional context, uses ideas from our work. In fact, it shows that we are making an impact into our popular culture. Now, sometimes that can be very negative, sometimes it can be positive, but my approach to the TV show Vikings is not to join reenactors and historians and archaeologists in saying this is all rubbish, this is all fiction, um, because the show at one level, although the actors claim sometimes uh, when interviewed that they are showing something rooted in history, the shows are really not about that. The shows are fictional dramas. They're not trying to show us what happened in the past. And so to say, oh, they've got it all wrong, they've not shown this or they have shown that, really misses the point. This is an opportunity for us. And in the last uh, eight years or so, we have enjoyed two, the production and development and dissemination of two major TV shows on the Viking Age, The Last Kingdom um, and Vikings. Now, the TV show Vikings from 2013 or thereabouts has produced, well, six series, but four, five and six are in two parts. So actually, we're looking at nine series equivalent of, of, of episodes exploring the early Viking Age in Scandinavia through the lens of the later sagas of Ragnar Lothbrok and various other um, literatures that reflect on the ninth century world. Therefore, this is an attempt to televise a version of dramas drawing mainly on later legendary sources, uh, not an attempt to write the history of ninth century Western Europe, Scandinavia. The show is far ranging and it takes us on a journey from um, what is really Norway, but they don't really talk about it as Norway in the first series. And I don't think even in the second series, or at least later in the second series, um, out into the West to interactions with the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms of Northumbria, of Mercia and Wessex. Um, not so much East Anglia, and they never go to Ireland and Western Britain or to Northern Britain, but you can't go everywhere. But also, I think that's a major criticism I have of the show is it does have geographical limitations. Um, it also takes the Vikings, in, uh, the Norsemen, uh, to the Frankish world. We have a very brief snippet of an insight into the Byzantine world, North Africa and the Rus. But my point is, it gives you a flavour of the expanse of the trading connections, the raiding connections, the political and diplomatic connections of the Norse peoples, of the Vikings, in the ninth century. A lot is conflated, confused. There's lots of details that are wrong and uh, problematic for the messages they convey. And yet there is so much compelling. The vast scale of the audience of this show 
its popularity in America, but also worldwide. Um, its ability to draw on uh, saga literature, um, but in particular, from my point of view, the way it creates an immersive material world that shows you not simply one Viking age, but many Viking ages, an evolving material world means that this is interesting for archaeologists. And I know they've consulted with historians and archaeologists, some of whom I know, to create this rich world. And that many of the so's creators uh, and designers, including the creator Michael Hurst, were reading not only the primary uh, um, historical and literature, um, historical sources and literature, but they were also looking at archaeological evidence. And um, so in all those senses, we are responsible for Vikings as academics, and we um, could see it not as simply a curse of misconceptions and misrepresentations, but as a potential positive avenue into um, getting new audiences involved and interested in the evidence that we have, the societies we're studying and the kinds of challenges of interpretation we face. Because in the choices the TV show has made, we see many of the challenges we also share in how we interpret the archaeological record. So I see, while there are problems, there are racial and cultural stereotypes, there are um, transplantings of later material and ideas onto earlier centuries, there's various sort of um, attempts to spin uh, sort of fictional dimensions of the TV show, including its interaction with the supernatural world, um, the portrayal of warrior women as a key ingredient of Scandinavian martial culture is much debated. There's things like that. There's also key important points one can gain from the show. It's education in many ways. It's entertainment, of course, but it has a potential for positive engagement in a range of communities who would otherwise not look at the primary material. And, and I would stress this importantly, it has a role to help us understand the problems we face in, in narrating through museums, through heritage sites, and in our archaeological writings, because Michael Hurst and, and his collaborators came up against the same challenges of what was available, what was happening in that ninth century world, as we as historians and archaeologists are facing in our interpretations. And many of their solutions, I would say, are dubious, um, but they're no more dubious than some of the stuff that's been written by us as academics in recent uh, years and even in months. <laughs> So in this introduction, I've given you a sense of the fact that actually the TV show Vikings, while a curse in some ways, is actually a massive blessing for us. The potential of education, engagement and actually reflecting on some of our interpretations and whether they play out when shown in such a, um, a dramatical setting are really useful. Now, I've addressed this in my second part of this video. I want to make the clear that I've addressed this through actually doing a series of blog posts. You can see here, if you look under the category Vikings, I have now written 44 posts on the TV show. And what I've done is I started with a general review back in February 2015, when the show was relatively new. And then I focused subsequently on the funerary and mortuary and memorial dimensions of the TV show. In other words, that's the area linked to my, my, my archaeological research, how we interpret death rituals in the past and how those ideas reflect in more recent uh, receptions within our popular culture. In series one review, I take you through all the funerals, the cremations, uh, the decapitations, the sacrificing of slave girls as part of uh, an elite funeral ceremony, and of course, uh, human sacrifice. Uh, but I particularly focus on uh, Al Earl Haraldson's funeral, where he is pushed out into the harbour at Katagat and cremated. So having introduced um, season one and its funerary rituals, and I make the point that while there are errors and problems, and I think the particular problem I had was the, the lack of animal sacrifice, the lack of funerary monumentality, um, 
uh, and perhaps some of the cremation practices are only partially represented. No, no post-cremation practices are shown. I thought it was really good at showing the diversity of funerary practices as we understand them from written sources and from the archaeological record. So in that regard, I think Vikings is spot on. And the only horned helmet is a winged helmet on the giantess who's leading the funeral funerary uh, ceremonies. Um, and therefore, it, it doesn't go down some of the stereotype roots, roots of popular culture representations of the Vikings, although it cultivates its own, including tattoo and face painting. Um, but that's for another discussion. So I started with that. And then I went through some specific scenes. So then I went through Floki digging up his dad. The use of skulls in season two, where we have a character, um, uh, Jarlborg, who's uh, a bit of a nutter and has a sort of love affair with the skull of his dead wife, who talks to him and eventually draws him to his own doom. Um, he drinks uh, mead out of it. And there it goes to his own blood eagling. And, and his, the skull is a witness on his own death. So you can read about that. Now, what else can I say? Um, I then take the, the show to task for some of the more ludicrous aspects, such as the show, representation of a uh, crucifixion of a epistate, as the bishop calls him, an, a, a, um, in, in a, a heathen, a monk who becomes a heathen, then uh, is caught by the West Saxons. The show is particularly obsessed with something we cannot demonstrate actually happened, which is cremating the dead on water. The whole of the death rituals of the TV show obsessed with watery death um, and not only Earl Haraldson being burnt on a ship on water, which is very much from the prose Edda and uh, Boulder's funeral, the god Boulder's funeral. We don't know if this was actually practiced in the Viking Age. Many logistical issues as well as uh, um, survival issues did it actually could it have been done and would we have evidence of it anyway so it's an open question but from my point of view we don't really think that happened they also have the war dead put on pontoons or and burnt um, we have but also we complement that with a discussion with a with a reflection on private mourning and here we have Ragnar on a beach mourning his own daughter's death so not all funerals are massive dramaturgical um, e um, expositions we, we do get a sense of the variety and variability of death rituals and that's a really important point for the TV show. Then we have uh, the importance of a coffin and uh, uh, in a in a plot line that I won't uh, be too much of a spoiler about we see a funeral uh, and Ragnar's coffin and its transportation and translation into the city of Paris uh, and, and the carving of an elaborate, almost hogback like slash boat like uh, coffin. It doesn't have any single archaeological inspiration as far as I'm aware, but it's a, it's, it's an, a, a really interesting moment where the dead are spoken to through the coffin by all the other lead characters. I think we get a sense of... Um, we get we get a, a world building through death ritual where we're shown a society that has evolving, intimate, personal relationships with the dead. They believe the dead live on and but can be interacted with through their tombs and graves. Unfortunately, they don't show a funerary monument and graves aren't shown as that. But with Floki's dad and with uh, Ragnar's coffin, we're shown hints at that. Um, so we see touching and talking with the dead, the um, walking with the dead, the procession itself. Um, and then we have the more intimate personal connection. So Athelstan's being given an anti-funeral, a funeral without uh, mourners by Ragnar because he was his best friend and um, as a Christian convert, if nominally uh, himself, uh, but he wants to give Athelstan a, a Christian burial in the Scandinavian landscape. Then we're shown a sort of another anti-funeral, but this for a, a, a um, an exiled, uh, the, a child of an exile at that time. So Angerbotha's anti-funeral. And then we are shown a grave interacted with in season four, part one, a Kalf's grave, um, almost uh, being a focus of um, exorcism to make sure that he doesn't come back and wreak his ghostly Ruengi on, uh, on Lagatha, his murderer. We then go back to more fantasy representation. So in, my, in the blog post from January 2017, I address Auslog's uh, funeral. Sorry, that's a bit of a spoiler there, but she gets killed. And like Earl Harrelson, she gets uh, a funeral organised by her, mer uh, her killers. So, um, but horse sacrifice, celebration is shown. We, 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 we get a sense of procession involving priests. We get to see the food, drink and weapons buried with her. And what's one of the interesting things is that 
She's burnt on a boat in an implausible fashion, maybe, but what's really interesting about it is that uh, she goes out with axes, like the uh, the female occupants of the Osibea ship. So I think that's a very, um, there's an attempt to show a, a not the, the one female character who's least likely to wield a weapon in battle, and she refuses to fight, um, is still given weapons in her grave. So I think it shows uh, that the Vikings TV show has a, perhaps a more nuanced understanding than some archaeologists of the burial furniture, grave furniture, needn't represent the identity of the dead person in a direct and simple way. So then I did a review post. Um, oh, hang on. I've got more to, to tell you about here. Um, I then go through a series of t um, posts looking at some of the presentations I did. Helga's funeral is very interesting. Um, I then um, go through uh, some of my... Uh, I then go through uh, the Viking warrior women story, which uh, burst onto the scene in September 2017. Uh, this is work done by mainly Swedish-based archaeologists, uh, claiming that uh, BJ581, a chamber grave from the Swedish um, proto-town of Birka, may have been a warrior woman. And I talk about here, we see the um, archaeological stories are less plausible than the TV show Vikings in many ways, because Vikings, one of the key things about it, with Lagatha, obviously uh, taken from legendary sources as a warrior woman, uh, is represented as a viable historical personage here of fighting, going on raids and fighting, and there's other warrior women shown with her on these raids. And uh, while I am not, uh, I don't, I, I'm not one of these people that thinks that this is outrageous or ridiculous or, or impossible, I, I just felt, feel that the archaeological evidence as presented was, was, was implausible. But what I, what I did find interesting was the, the thirst for this, the, the, the popular demand for or need to see a warrior woman and how that manifests itself in the media, the public reaction and the academic responses to the story. So I did a series of reviews that connect the TV show to new archaeological research before returning to look at further funerals shown in season five, including the development of an Icelandic cemetery, the first settlers of Iceland are shown. Um, it goes a bit, that plot line goes really, really tests my patience. But anyway, um, what's interesting is that the grey form, again, tests my patience, but there is an attempt to show the evolution of a cemetery, sort of materialising the feuds between the first settlers and uh, in, in a raiding context, we are shown one of the sons of Ragnar given a funeral and a kind of boat grave of sorts um, with a modest, too modest, but a mound by a riverside. So you are given almost like a, a Viking winter camp uh, sort of uh, setting to a burial. And that's totally plausible from the archaeological evidence we have from a range of these Viking winter camps, including Repton and, and Torxy as well, I was thinking. So... We have this, this this attempt to respond to the archaeology, but create a fictional representation. Now, there's some crossovers I do with The Last Kingdom. Um, um, some stuff I talk about, I'll talk about in a minute, about my representation of the TV show in, in a publication. A crossover on early medieval stone crosses, as they're represented in the TV shows The Last Kingdom and Vikings. And then I cover the cremated war dead outside the gates of Paris and how they are cremated. Uh, uh, Viking warrior women. The West Saxons, uh, when they're in the uh, the marshes of Ath Athelney in Somerset, start cremating their diseased dead. That was an interesting take. Not implausible. They use cremation as a smoke street screen to deceive the, uh, the, the the Saxons. I talk about the helmets in the TV show, the megaliths in the show, ghosts in the TV show, the use of power and ritual to deceive and subvert and... Um, so on. And then season five, part two, the aesthetics of execution, the, the Icelandic cemetery. That's about a book I'm going to talk about. And also I go through um, a history extra article I wrote um, and the seer's death and right up to the present looking at season six. So that's my little review to give you a sense. I've got lots of posts looking at individual dimensions, focusing on, focusing on the pagan or non-Christian funerary ritual shown in the TV show. My latest post is actually about horned helmets because they finally get around in season six to showing horned helmets. So you can read those in your own time. But I think that what we see is an evolving 
complex, diverse funerary record shown in the TV show in which some key elements from the archaeological record and from later sources are present, including boat graves, burial by water, by settlements, elaborate performances involving animal sacrifice, sometimes human sacrifice, all those elements we know about, even though we don't know exactly their frequency, but there's a lot of diversity in that archaeological and historical record. A lot of that has gone into the TV show. Not in a way that necessarily I would have designed it if I was trying to do an educational video, but this is not an educational video. This is a piece of TV fiction trying to show you quasi or semi historical characters do in, a, in an engaging storyline. So we cannot judge it on the criteria of they've got it right or wrong. It's simply not the right way to approach this show. Now, I've taken these ideas from the blog and I've put them into publications. Now, um, the University of Chester Archaeology Student Conferences I've been facilitating with students and then publishing the results of, I have published one article in the first one. This is the Public Archaeology of Death, published in 2019, um, sorry, only a year and a bit ago. And this book uh, contains within it, uh, the final chapter actually, is, is by me. And I look at um, the, the the TV sh rep shows representations of funerals from season one to four, which means, hint, hint, I'm going to do a subsequent paper reflecting on seasons five and six. But since season six, part two is yet to be aired, I can't write that yet. But I think I will be evaluating those separate last two seasons and seeing whether my criticisms and compliments of the TV show and what I think it does for us as an academic community in this audience is um, I can reflect on all of that and see what's different about seasons five and six and there is things that are different as I my blog has already shown they have taken on board some of the criticisms there are more monuments um, but there's also consistency and, and continuity in terms of the way they're showing uh, the variable and complex and elaborate funerals but one key character's funeral I've still got to blog about. So there's a book chapter in the Equinox published 2019 book, The Public Archaeology of Death. But I've also written up two further reflections on the TV show in the first ever academic collection about Vikings. Vikings and the Vikings. Essays on television's History Channel series. And this is edited by Paul Hardwick and Kate Lister. And it's a worthwhile buy with chapters reflecting from various archaeological, historical and literary perspectives on the um, TV show and the evidence behind it and some of the dangerous and challenging and ongoing debates we're having uh, with the interactions between that and popular culture, including North American white nationalism and threats of appropriation of the TV show, but also some of the um, the sort of literary this, this, this TV show is part of a literary culture since the 18th century of re receiving and adapting the Viking Age to different audiences. So in many ways, we're seeing the TV show building off that tradition. So reception studies and um, studies of the Viking Age from different disciplinary point of views are finding the TV show of use and of interest and are paying attention to it. Now, in this book, I've got two co-authored chapters. Having looked at the uh, funerals in the public archaeology of death, I have a co-authored chapter with Dr. Alison Cleveness of the University of Stockholm looking at dialogues with the dead in Vikings. And while we have criticisms of the TV show, we do point out that throughout, particularly from season two onwards, we are shown intersections between the living and the dead, not only in terms of just imagining ghosts appear, but physical real world interactions, digging into old graves, retrieving old objects, talking with the dead at funerary sites. And we, we argue that while the TV show is taking this further than we have evidence for and misses out some key points, um, this is reflective of what we know about uh, Viking Age society, that the, 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 the death is not the end and the grave is not the end. And that's really interesting. So I actually have a, an article in this book, Vikings and the Vikings, looking at that aspect. And I have another co-authored chapter, this one uh, lead authored by Dr. Alexandra Sandmark uh, of the University of Highlands and Islands, 
called Things in Vikings. And that links to my earlier Stickman representation, because for my first book, I got permission to reproduce images from the TV show, but for subsequently, I couldn't get them. So in my Stick Vikings uh, blog post, I make the point that I, I, I faced the challenge of how do I show the funeral scenes, the assembly places and practices as represented the TV show? Well, I created my own little stick versions. I screen captured the TV show. And I and actually this was really useful because by doing so, by creating these stylizations, so this is the lawgiver on the law rock at the beginning of season two and the audience, and then comparing that with the later scene from season four, part one, there's Bjorn Ironside and Queen Aslog and the crowd gathered at Kattegat, same law rock. You can see the historical evolution of Viking Age society from a relatively egalitarian small scale community where the, the law giver, giver is presented as outside of the um, he's not really because he's corrupted and bribed, but the idea is he's shown somewhat outside of the dynamics of social personal connections. We're shown a sort of more despotic world uh, of leaders sort of usurping and, and distributing gold and treasure from the law rock. Now, I'm not saying this is accurate and we Alexandra and myself point out how there are many errors in how they're portraying um, indoor and outdoor things. That's so it's not it's not about accuracy, but how it does capture something of the the political manipulations and dynamics of that Viking world. And the stick figures, I think, are part of that story. So through my archaeological blogging and now through a series of peer-reviewed academic articles I, and chapters. I have attempted to evaluate and um, critique the TV show Vikings and its portrayal of funerals and dialogues between the living and the dead and other aspects of its material culture and its landscape. And in doing so, I think this is not simply looking at how these things are received as if they are separate from our academic endeavours. I see this as an integral part of what I'm doing with my teaching and my research of looking at the connections between our discipline and wider popular culture and seeing how whether we like it or not we are having an impact having an effect but it's not always controlled or designed and sometimes we have to correct and critique other times we can sort of say hey this is really important it's showing us um, um, things that uh, are reflective of our work are, are built on our work this is really good on other occasions, though, and this is my final point, is that it's neither of those things. It's not getting it wrong and critiquing it. It's neither going, yeah, look at how we're making an impact. It's about using it as a, a, a point of reflection in our own storytelling. Are the TV shows unwittingly bringing up issues for some of our interpretations? Are they show, um, drawing into sharp relief some of the more un incomplete or problematic aspects of our academic writing and for death rituals I believe that's exactly what's going on I think the TV show is doing a great service in some regards it's getting a lot it's going into the realms of fantasy as uh, uh, John LeMessurier used to say in Dad's Army you, know, you see a lot of the realms of fantasy going on uh, but also um, it's very much a response to a longer term dialogue in our society between academic writings and popular culture and in that regard i think it's, it's throwing up some yawning gaps in the way we, we we have neglected as academics some aspects of death rituals and memorial practices in the viking age and the the, the, the absence of any monuments is one of these that there's no really lot the dead aren't in the landscape we don't see them um, it's a landscape of the living the dead are out of place and out of mind that's very much a modern aesthetic but it's one that very much plays into how we treat death and the dead as a separate field of research by academics and as a closed system and I think this is something that a number of scholars have been frustrated with for a long time um, but still comes back to haunt us I'm certainly been guilty of doing that in some ways in my own work and so we can look at Vikings, we can see what's right and wrong with it, but we can also see what's right and wrong with our own work. And I think being a bit more humble about these um, popular sources, neither celebrating them or denigrating them, but seeing them as a manifestation of an ongoing dialogue between academia and popular culture means that we can start to actually not see them as just, well, they've, they've achieved this, they haven't achieved that, but what they've left out, what they failed to address is often because we as academics have always failed to address those issues too.
So I hope that's uh, an interesting topic for you. Go and read my blogs if you'd like, or the publications. Uh, the, this this um, paperback book from McFarland Press, I should have said, Vikings and the Vikings, should interest a lot of you. And um, while slightly more expensive, the edited collection, The Public Archaeology of Death, is about more than just Vikings, but it does have some good papers in that. And I, I will I also point out, although there's no papers about the TV show Vikings, the first ever book... Uh, looking at the public archaeology on politics on of um, the early Middle Ages is out, and I've co-edited that called Digging into the Dark Ages. That's downloadable from the Archaeopress website. So there's increasing attention and resources um, afforded by archaeologists to looking at our popular reception, and it's not because it's just oh this is it's not fluffy stuff. This has a real impact on how, on how people engage with our discipline and how they take it forward. So we, we, we need to pay attention to it. Be wary of the misrepresentations, critique the na underlying narratives, but also be aware that this is an opportunity as much as it's a, ch it's a problem. So we can really work with this material, not because it's all right and it's all good and it's all positive, but because it's what a lot of people are getting. And therefore, we have to be part of that broader debate about what the Vikings were like and what they mean to us. And through death rituals, that's one way I've done it. Sadly, we're all going to die. But while you're waiting, why not follow Archeo Death? Subscribe now on YouTube.